So we're presenting uh, on this ongoing oral history project that is looking at the roughly the first decade of Vancouver's HIV and AIDS epidemic. Um, we're in the early stages still in a lot of ways. Um, we're, um, we haven't done as many interviews as we were kind of hoping to at this point, so there's a lot more of that work to be done. So we're not actually really sharing findings so much as we're kind of giving a, a bit of insight into our process so far and uh, how this has gone. Um, how this has gone for us so far, uh, and, and kind of what you can look forward to maybe in the future as we, as we do move towards having some findings. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Terry and let him introduce our team, if that's, if mm -hmm. that's good with you. So I uh, just wanted to show this slide, uh, and beyond the obvious of these are the people that have been supporting us for this project, I think it's really important to note that um, it's incredibly diverse. This is truly a community-based and a community-initiated project where uh, when Nathan Lachowski and Ben approached me and asked me about this project and thought, or asked me what I thought of it and asked how I would like to be involved, it was something that really resonated in, in the um, information that we had gotten from community and over the decades that I've been working in HIV in some form, lots of people have said, this is too important to let go to history. We need to capture this and you know somebody's got to do this project. So we did. And as you can see by the logos, not only do we have um, a really great representative group from academia and community, but it's also um, not only uh, age-wise, but it's cultural-wise and gender-wise. And um, even within the academics, it's, uh, it's quite great because there's a number of disciplines, history and public health and epidemiology, and a lot of different areas in academia came together to make this project happen. So a little bit about um, what we're actually doing. Um, I don't know. There we go, they're point by point. Just, um, I just wanted to cover really what it, this project is all about and um, where it's going. We're not presenting, as Ben said, all of the results today. We are really at the very um, beginning of this and we are doing some interviews now and we are actively in recruitment. Ben will give a shameless little plug in a, in a minute about people that are, wanna be involved in this. We really do wanna hear from you. But um, we do really wanna cover the four main areas which are uh, essentially the overview of our project, what it is we're hoping to do, and how we're going to do it, and where we are in the project at this particular point, and then finally what the last steps are and you know our future um, implications of this project itself. And just to provide like a very brief um, idea of how I got involved in this research, um, as an undergrad, I started looking at Engels, which is a local uh, gay and lesbian periodical. Um, I presented on some of this stuff a couple years ago here, uh, and uh, I was really interested in how gay men were coming to understand the epidemic at the time, and uh, I mean, kind of in turn, how gay men understand the epidemic looking back. And so this kind of led me uh, into oral history. This was kind of like the natural next step for me because I, these are the stories and experiences that I'm really interested in. Um, so when we kind of look at the what has been written about the epidemic, we see lots of uh, lots of different ways in which the ep epidemic has been talked about. Um, <clears throat> you know, plays, documentaries, works of journalism, a massive amount of academic work. But when we're looking at the early portions of the epidemic, um, we're mostly looking at a couple contexts: uh, New York and San Francisco, and a couple other places, and not really talking about Vancouver very much, or a lot of other contexts for that matter. But right now, we're focused on Vancouver. Um, and when we look at oral history projects, we see some very extensive work that has been done in terms of documenting these stories and experiences. Uh, this is the ACT UP Oral History Project, uh, which is a great example of how this has been done in some contexts. Uh, and it's a massive amount of work. There's, there's almost 200 interviews here uh, on one activist organization, very important activist organization. But there's nothing kind of of this nature that's been done in Vancouver. Um, there's been a few, there's been a handful of interviews done, but nothing kind of large or um, exhaustive in any in any way shape or form so we kind of take this as an inspiration for what we can do in vancouver but we also see that there's a big gap here um and i've been kind of talking a little bit about oral history i should probably tell you what i actually mean by that um this is a photo of joan nessel uh, and mabel hampton joan nessel is a very well-known scholar of or or oral history uh, she started the lesbian her story archives and basically has devoted her career to preserving lesbian history through oral history. Um, and this is just a good quote to uh, 
to give an idea of what I think is, uh, is so powerful about oral history. So Joan Nestle says, oral history allows you to get at national stories that perhaps the nation does not want you to hear, that it has no respect or appreciation for, and you get them in the voice and body of the person who risked everything to live them. So for me, this kind of speaks to the power of oral history, this kind of talking to somebody who actually experienced this firsthand. But it also, um, it's a way of correcting for what's not included in the historical record a lot of the time, or in mainstream kind of discussions of events. So, um, so there's a lot of power in actually restoring agency to people that have typically been left outside of these narratives. <coughs> so what oral history often looks like is, um, it's, uh, it's similar to a lot of other forms of interviewing, but it's a little bit more open-ended. Um, the goal is to leave people space to tell their stories um, and to allow them to steer where the interview goes to a large extent. Um, so we have an interview guide, uh, but it's a very broad, it has very broad questions, and the goal is to kind of lead people uh, and give them lots of space to, to kind of uh, articulate what happened to them in their own terms. Um, and this often means that we're not just talking about the facts of particular types of events, we're really interested in, um, in how people interpreted those events, how they experienced those events uh, in a more tangible kind of way. So what was Vancouver like in those days? So we thought we would trot, trot out a couple of dinosaurs, such as myself, to um, really talk about what it was like. Um, we were talking about the late 80s, early 90s. We had Bill van der Zam in government, who was you know, a, a right-wing, conservative, very homophobic premier that was uh, head of the province who was technically more interested in the health of plants than he was of people. So um, we started hearing about this gay disease that was taking over Vancouver and other urban centers. We fortunately were a little bit behind the US cities, but we noticed very quickly the impact that it was having on Vancouver at that time. And the response, the public health response, the medical response, and the government response was very, very slow at that time. So it really kind of spawned an era of activism. There were uh, models like ACT UP in the US, and uh, they formed Canadian chapters in across Canada, and in Vancouver in particular. And it was the birth of aid service organizations like um, the Vancouver AIDS Foundation or Vancouver AIDS Society, I think it was called at that time, now AIDS Vancouver, and uh, the PWA Coalition. Those were the first of its kind or their kind in, in Vancouver and in Canada. And so um, it, came, it was a time of coming together as a gay community. It was really gay men that were driving the the whole response to the epidemic at that time because we were most severely impacted at that point. So just to provide a very brief overview of where we kind of see this project going and what we're, what we're trying to do here. Um, on the most basic level in collecting these stories and experiences, we're, we're wanting to preserve this, this history, this cultural memory. This is part of how we got to be where we are as a community and I think that's a very important thing to preserve just on a surface level. Um, so this, this, we're kind of conceptualizing um, an, an oral history online accessible archive uh, as kind of an end, an end goal of the project. Um, and it's, a, it's especially important to collect these stories now um, because we are, we are entering another new era of what HIV means. And so these older meanings uh, attached to the epidemic are really being pushed aside in some ways. So it's very important that we, we collect these stories. Um, relatedly, we're hoping that this leads to some more cross-generational dialogue. Um, we realize that long-term survivors don't actually talk to younger gay men a lot of the time, and so this is something that we're really hoping the project fosters. Um, we have a lot to learn from each other as a community. And uh, we're also hoping that this kind of ultimately contributes a more nuanced temporal lens to future health research, promotion, and care, which is just basically a fancy way of saying history is part of the way we do health. We need to think about history when we approach these health topics um, because how we got to where we are matters. Um, so overall, the goal here is to collect these experiences of how gay men confronted the epidemic and experienced the epidemic and think about how this kind of contributes to the way that they currently understand HIV in this contemporary era of, of treatment advancements and, and combination prevention. So uh, as we've started to kind of delve into this project, we realized that there are a lot of people that are, that are interested, and so we kind of had to set up some parameters around who we can actually include, because this is actually 
a fairly small project as it stands right now. So we're really just interested in talking to people uh, at the moment who lived in Vancouver between the early 1980s and, and early 1990s for at least a year, um, because we want them to have some insight on the local epidemic. Um, we also want uh, older gay men born before 1970, uh, because again, we want them to have had that kind of first person perspective on the early, or early years of the epidemic. And then we've kind of divided things up into two groups. We have, we have long-term survivors who identify as gay, bisexual, queer, two-spirit, trans, or a same-gender loving person uh, who were diagnosed prior to 1996. That's kind of how we're conceptualizing long-term survivors for this project. Um, and then we're talking to caregivers uh, who we're not, we're not really just interested in talking to healthcare providers. It's more people that provided uh, significant social, emotional, and relational support to people living with HIV uh, and AIDS prior to 1996. So this would be more like um, looking after a friend or a partner uh, in, in a less formal setting. Um, although we also realize that those roles often crossed over in a lot of interesting ways. Uh, so um, this, is the, this is the small piece of uh, self-promotion. Um, we should have flashing animation <laughs> on this. Uh, so yes, if you are interested, I am, uh, I'm the person to talk to. Uh, and if you know anybody else who's interested, please feel free to share this information. We're definitely looking for participants still, so yeah. And his email is quite easy to remember. If you didn't notice there, it's bjkate at sfu.ca. <laughs> so uh, we wanted to cover um, some of the consultation project or process in this as well, because this was an incredibly important piece of it, where we did bring together um, a lot of different groups of people. We heard um, from uh, the initial consultation that we did, we heard from people that, you know, we should really hold a, a public forum of some kind. So we did. We held a, a town hall kind of forum. Um, we had Nate was uh, our Oprah, and we did an Oprah-style interview on a stage with uh, a group of people that were panelists, and uh, they each talked about their experience at that time in order to um, sort of generate some interest in, from the audience and make it interactive. And boy, was it interactive. We had probably about 50 people that showed up for our town hall meeting. And so we asked for their feedback during the time that we were talking and you know, maybe uh, um, spurring memories of, of things that had happened at that time. And we heard loud and clear that people, you know, the, the caregiver portion of this was very important and that we didn't want to lose that piece. People that were both formal and informal caregivers, I think that was really important to note, that there were people who were professional healthcare people like nurses who also um, were caring for a partner or caring for a friend and buddy programs that started up across the city as well. So we really did want to cover and make sure that we included caregivers um, as well um, as the, the gay men themselves that had experienced this, uh, the epidemic and the plague at that particular time. So, um, whoop, is there more? Yes. So um, we really had a big discussion in that room about, you know, whose stories are worth capturing and how do we um, make sure that we are responsible and respect the fact that many people lived through this. It wasn't just the people living with the disease at that time, but also people around them. It had a huge impact on the community. It had a huge impact on people and friends and families, et cetera, our, our chosen families as well as our, um, our, our natural families. So people really um, responded well and told us that they wanted to make sure we capt captured all of those stories. And then the diversity. It's always an issue when we're working in gay men's health to try and um, add in the diversity piece. We have um, on our panel and our community advisory group, we have two spirit indigenous men and we have other men of um, other uh, other men of color but how do we reach people that experienced it at that time and we're dealing with an even higher level of stigma than in the the caucasian population that was front and center of this this time so we are really making a huge effort to try and include diversity in this and hear all of the stories um, from and and the lesbian community as well who were huge caregivers at that time we didn't want to lose that connection or um, not have that that story respected as well and finally um, you know, how is the epidemic at that time, in that point in history, how has it shaped the gay community and the greater community, the healthcare community? Because there were certainly pioneers in healthcare in the very early days that went against 
the, the, the status quo and, you know, threw off the hazmat suits and took off the gloves and hugged people, et cetera. So, you know, how do we capture those stories as well and respect that part of, of history? But really looking going forward, how can this also shape prevention activities and prevention campaigns? Um, how can it infect or affect the, um, the, the, the teachings that we re really want to pass on to another generation from, from this point forward? So here's, a, here's an image of most of our team looking, looking very nice, I must say. Um, we're missing a couple of people in there, but uh, that's most of us. Um, just to give you an idea of what we're kind of planning to do in the grand scheme of things here, uh, we, this is a kind of a pilot project. We only have 30 interviews to work with. Uh, and so we're, we do have to keep it very uh, restricted in some ways, but the goal is to eventually scale up uh, with more grant funding and this would mean scaling up in terms of eligibility to include not just gay men, but other people who were disproportionately impacted by the epidemic, um, women, indigenous people, uh, people who used injection drugs, uh, because their stories really matter as well. And so we, we hope to scale up in that regard, um, but also geographically. So first uh, moving to the Victoria area and the rest of BC, um, because again, um, you know, a person's experience in a rural context would be very different from Vancouver, and we don't want to just focus on Vancouver ultimately. And then hopefully, uh, you know, grant funding willing, uh, we'd scale up to a national level and try to collect these stories across Canada and compare, compare across some national contexts. So we just want to really briefly provide uh, an idea of what we've, some themes that have emerged early on. We're not presenting findings, as we've said, but these are just a few things that have stood out to us so far. Um, first of all, uh, participant, this is an obvious thing, but participant stories have really differed in a lot of important ways. Um, so we're realizing early on that we're, we're obviously not going to emerge with this cohesive idea of what the epidemic looked like for everyone. Um, and it will be really important for us to emphasize where these stories diverge and why they diverged, just as much as it's important for us to focus on the similarities. Um, we've also seen that identity matters a lot. And we're not just talking about sexual orientation here, we're talking about uh, race, class, HIV status. These are things that deeply shape the way people experience the epidemic. Um, we, we've seen that people have really emphasized activism, and we've seen other people that have really emphasized the emotional support and caregiving roles. Um, but most, most participants have articulated that both of those roles were really important. Um, we haven't talked to anybody yet who kind of was firmly footed in kind of both of those things. Um, but they, everybody has said, you know, I wasn't an activist, for instance, but, uh, you know, I really, I, that was something that needed to happen. Um, and so there's kind of like this mutual respect across those categories. Um, relatedly, we've seen that the emotional impact of the epidemic is very complex. We have a tendency to talk about certain forms of emotional expression, like anger, um, compassion, um, heroism. These are all really important things that emerge in the epidemic. But we also have to look at the, the, the darker side of this, um, the loss, the trauma, um, the, sad, the, 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 the you know, overarching sadness associated with this, because if we really want to capture these experiences, those are emotions we have to, we have to grapple with. Uh, and finally, we've seen that uh, AIDS changed gay men's relationships to the gay community in very complicated ways. Um, we've heard from people who said that they absolutely found community uh, partially as a result of the epidemic. We've also heard from some people that said that they felt very alienated from the community during the epidemic, uh, and they found community elsewhere. So um, we'll have to kind of examine that theme of community in a little bit more detail as we go along. So just uh, one final slide here, um, and this is just a very brief taste, one tiny part of one person's story. Um, so it's not generalizable, but um, just this theme of community, I think, will be something interesting to explore. So uh, HIV created an idea that there was a community of which I was a part and that we were working together towards a common goal. Before the epidemic, I wasn't conscious of being part of the gay community. I was conscious of being gay. Uh, my sense of becoming part of a community arose out of my response to HIV and the community's response to HIV. They happened together, and that brought me into a sense of community. So as I've said, this isn't something that is, is going to be uh, crucial to everybody's story, but I think it will be a really interesting theme to engage with as we, as we continue with this project. And hopefully next time you see us, we'll have a lot more to share with you in the way of findings. So 
And uh, just one final thing, I, I do want to thank John Kosachenko, who also has um, very graciously lent us his incredible informal uh, photographic archive of, of that time. He was around town constantly with his camera, and he's shared a lot of his photographic memories with us and uh, is allowing us, to allowing us to use his photos for this project as well. And I, of course, Nathan and Ben, I thank you guys for uh, approaching me and for uh, letting us to really endeavor to capture this important story. So thank you. Thanks.